Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining this briefing on the federal investment in service learning. Could I ask Hill staff to comment in the chat box with your name, the member you work for, and the issues you work on? Thank you. I'm Susan Stroud. I'm a senior fellow at the Nashman Center for Civic Engagement and Public Service at the George Washington University and a member of the steering committee for the Coalition for Service Learning, which is the sponsor organization of this briefing. The Coalition for Service Learning is a 160 member organization of national and local organizations across the United States that supports the restoration of funding to learn and serve America a service learning grants program at the Corporation for National and Community Service. The coalition was formed in 2020 when the National Commission on Military, National and Public Service issued its report with a list of recommendations for improving opportunities for all Americans to serve their communities and their country in a variety of modalities in the military, through civic education and service learning, through national service programs like AmeriCorps and Senior Corps, and through government service. The Commission's specific recommendation about restoring funding for service learning in schools and universities to the Corporation for National Community Service was the initial impetus for creating the Coalition for Service Learning. You will hear more about the history of Learn and Serve America at the Corporation, as well as more details about the National Commission's recommendations in the presentations that follow. Today's briefing consists of three parts, an historical recap of the federal investment in service learning. This will be followed by two panels on the impact of service learning. And we will also hear from a group of practitioners about their experience with service learning. So now just a few housekeeping details. We intend to keep this briefing to one hour. It will be recorded and available on the coalition's website, the address of which is in the chat. We've posted a lot of useful information about service learning and the coalition's efforts on the website, and we encourage you to look at that. We ask you to please put your questions in the Q&A, and we will then consolidate the questions and responses on the website after today's briefing please use the chat function for other comments. I want to thank everyone for attending. I also want to thank the other members of the coalition's steering committee and a special thanks to the presenters. So now to Brian Lee, who will emcee today's briefing. Brian is a rising sophomore at Duke and active in Duke's service learning program. Brian is interning at the National Youth Leadership Council this summer and has been working with the coalition. I'll come back to facilitate Q and A's if there's any time remaining and to wrap up. So Brian, over to you. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's a great day and a great opportunity to be here. Um, so right now I just wanna pass it over um, to Amy Cohen of the George Washington University. And as you can see on the screen, she's the former director of Learn and Serve America. And she's gonna give a brief presentation about the history of the federal investment of service learning. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, it's great to be here with all of you today. Um, I am Amy Cohen. I'm currently the executive director of the Honey W. Nashman Center for Civic Engagement and Public Service at GW, where we partner with nonprofits and schools in DC to organize service and community engagement as part of our educational and equity mission. Before this, as Brian mentioned, I worked at the Corporation for National Community Service, where for eight years, I was the director of Learn and Serve America the program at the corporation that supported student and youth service learning across the country. Before that, I worked to establish community partnerships and service learning programs in West Philadelphia and the region while at the University of Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. Um, we wanted to provide a bit of context today about the longevity of the federal investment, not just in community service, but specifically in service undertaken by students as a part of their education in schools, colleges, and community-based organizations. This dates all the way back to the Office of Economic Opportunity, which launched VISTA in 1964, and taking advantage of then prevalent student activism and passion for social change, launched the National Student Volunteer Program in 1968, which even then 
engaged more than 700 colleges in programming to support service. Next slide, please. In 1971, the Action Agency was created. This is the direct precursor to the current Corporation for National and Community Service slash AmeriCorps Agency. And it provided millions in funding and support for student service and service learning programs in K-12 schools and colleges. Action's National Center for Service Learning published a magazine called The Synergist, um, which provided training and technical assistance for their grantees and for the education sector more widely. In addition, in the 70s, Action's University Year for Action funded about 60 colleges a year. And later in the 80s, the National Student Community Service Program supported service learning from kindergarten through college. We can move on to the next one. The National and Community Service Act of 1990 kicked off an era of significant investment and a ramping up of the idea of service learning throughout the US. The initial pilot Serve America programs created an ecosystem of service learning programs in schools and colleges throughout the country. And for the first time codified the definition of service learning as service that is part of an educational program with academic and civic objectives and is designed with the community to meet community identified objectives. Next slide. With the Clinton administration in 1993 came the full development of the Corporation for National and Community Service with programs that were designed to support service for all Americans throughout the lifespan. At the time, there were three programs, Learn and Serve America, which supported programs for students from kindergarten through college, AmeriCorps for individuals 16 and up, and the Senior Corps programs. Together, these created opportunities for service from cradle to grave. In Learn and Serve America, most funding went to intermediary organizations, nationally to folks like YMCA, the United Negro College Fund, the Association of Community Colleges, as well as some of my colleagues here today, uh, like the National Youth Leadership Council, Youth Service America. Um, and it also went to statewide and regional intermediaries, groups like uh, Kids Consortium in Maine, the National Indian Youth Leadership Program, as well as to state education agencies and many of the state commissions on service. Next slide. Together, this created an infrastructure and professional development network for service learning that reached well beyond the grant funded 1700 local programs each year and the million to million and a half students. And our program guidance ensured that much of the funding reached youth in Title I schools to give them the opportunity to flip the script, to allow students who are most likely to be seen as in need of service to be the assets in their community. Next slide. In 2009, the national service legislation was reauthorized through the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act. Here, the authorized appropriation level for Learn and Serve was raised and a new authority for specific innovative programs was provided. Support most importantly for the summer of service and the semester of service. In addition, commissions for national service in each state became eligible to apply for a wider array of programs. Unfortunately, after only one year of funding for the new programs, funding for Learn and Serve was eliminated in its entirety in the FY11 budget. In an era of enforced budget neutrality, a new program, which itself was later eliminated, replaced the Learn and Serve funding. Next slide. All of which brings us back to why we're here today. As Susan Stroud mentioned, the National Commission's recommendation and it was their second recommendation in the entire report is to create a service learning fund at the Corporation for National Community Service to support programs for K-12 and higher ed students. The goal is to engage as many students as possible as assets and problem solvers within their communities through meaningful service connected with their academic, civic, and character development. Next slide. These programs support youth engagement in their communities and help to develop student self-efficacy and skills. The commission's recommendation does not require any new legislation. It only requires appropriations to create a new era when positive student service and service learning is an expectation for students of all ages. Brian, back to you. Thank you, Amy. That was a really in interesting and insightful um, 
yet brief uh, presentation about the history of the federal investment. And so now I'd like to pass it on to the first panel, which will be talking about the impact of service learning. This panel consists of three people. Um, Emily Samos of ECS Consulting, who was a former program director on the Learn and Serve America staff, who will be talking about Learn and Serve America, um, as well as Susan Abravano of Susan Abravano Consulting, who will be discussing the summer of service, and Michael Minx of Youth Service America, who will be talking about the semester of service, and they'll all be talking about the impact of federal investment in Learn and Serve. Thanks, Brian, and hi, everybody. We're so glad that you're here with us today. As Brian said, I'm Emily Samos, and I am a consultant working with lots of different organizations in what I like to call community-driven education. And I have a, a long history with Learn and Serve America, so I do get to, in my consulting work, get to work with Amy and the Nashville Center um, at GW. Um, and I'm really, really excited to be part of the Service Learning Coalition. So I just wanna talk a little bit about some of the impact that we have seen from service learning over the years. As Amy said, Learn and Serve was established back in 1993 and then reauthorized in 2009 with the Serve America Act with about 40 million in grants going out to 1,700 LEAs, nonprofit colleges and universities and tribes. So that's nearly 20 years of funding and program, program, programming <laughs> before it lost its appropriations in 2011. And I'd like to review some of the many ways that these funds and the unique approach of service learning has made an impact. And so first of all, we can discuss how participation in service learning, whether in a K-12 class, an after-school program, or community-based program, or a college course, benefits the young participants, as you can see here. Um, several studies over the years have demonstrated that service learning enhances educational engagement, reduces the achievement gap, increases support for racial diversity, advances civic education and engagement, and builds workforce skills and interests. And I just want to say that we put enhances educational engagement at the top of the list for a reason. This is a, the special sauce of service learning, because by combining aspects of what is most important to students, which is working on addressing issues impacting their own communities, connecting that to their academic learning and their school experience overall, they become much more engaged in that academic content and then want to continue to learn more. So next slide. Um, and now we can take a look at a quick snap, snapshot of some of the most significant ways that fed, the federal investment in service learning has made you know, a nationwide impact. Again, as Amy mentioned, over 1 million students were engaged each year in service learning directly funded by Learn and Serve America. And this expanded into another three to four million students who were engaged by teachers and college professors who had previously received grants and, and were now um, continuing service learning with their students or after school programs. Um, and that they've made that a core part of their activities. We also know that the federal support for service learning led to states adopting it as part of their education policies as evidenced by 42 states, including it in their education policies in 2011. And then again, Amy mentioned this too, but breaking it down a bit further, federal funding for service learning resulted in 600 individual schools, 450 school districts, 985 community colleges, and 240 colleges and universities receiving funding support for service learning. And that meant more than 35,000 K-12 teachers and higher education faculty were benefiting from direct funding. And this is also an important point, over 14 million hours of volunteer service to more than 16,000 16, community-based agencies were contributed. So the service component of the service learning has a real impact on communities and a, tr and a true benefit to organizations that are addressing the most pressing issues in our communities. Uh, next slide. Um, federal funding also allowed for research and program evaluation. So that was also funded. Um, and in 2004, NYLC was able to conduct a national survey, survey on service and service learning in public schools, which led to these important findings from the school principal perspective. So you, as you can see, there's very high ratings from principals and schools with service learning programs on its impact on student civic engagement and academic achievement, at the same time that they see positive impacts on teacher satisfaction, school climate, and the, commu the community's view of students as resources. And next slide. And this is interesting, I know it's a little hard to see, but um, I mentioned that in 2011, almost all states had adopted service learning into their policies. And this slide shows how school systems were institutionalizing service learning back in 2006, 2007, after receiving the federal grants from Learn and Serve America. So 86% of LSA grantees reported that service learning was now a regular part of their curriculum. The 72% saying they had a uh, designated staff role for service learning coordination. 
and 68% said that youth were involved in decision making. How cool is that? And kind of rare. So that's that's the impact service learning has. Uh, slide six or next slide. <laughs> Um, and finally, it's helpful to look a little closer at the policies supporting service learning in two states. So we'll just take a look at Arizona and Minnesota. And this information is from a, a 2012 report from Education Commission of the States, which is, has always been a great supporter of service learning, highlighting how five states um, moved forward with service learning after LSA lost its appropriations in, in 2011. So Arizona state policy specifically identifies how service learning can be used to meet the state standards while 14 state education initiatives incorporate service learning, including 21st century community learning centers and then early education, which I think is, is so cool. Um, in Minnesota, districts can use their budgets for service learning and um, state policies include at least five other provisions in support of service learning. And we may get to hear a little bit more about how this has impacted students and how um, it's played out in our next panel. Um, and so that, you know, that's just like a quick sort of overview of the different ways that service learning has impacted students, impacted schools, you know, we talked about school climate, impacts communities, um, and then I, I, I think I could hit it back to Brian now. Hi, um, yeah, so I think that Emily's uh, point was really good about the impact of service learning. And I would like to just pass it now to Susan about the summer of service learning. Um, so just to get a little more specific look at the impact. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, I'm Susan Abravanel. I um, have my own consulting company, Susan Abravanel Consulting, which I established in 2014. Um, after about 20 years of working to develop curriculum and to um, develop professional development for K-12 teachers in the field of service learning. So we know that the summer months provide an optimal time to engage youth in positive activities, reinforcing and expanding upon the knowledge and skills and attributes taught during the school year. Please, next slide. Uh, programming opportunities are scarce, particularly for middle school students in economically challenged communities. They're too old for childcare, yet too young for job training programs. Summer of Service is a summer service learning program that was designed and operated by Innovations in Civic Participation. And it was initially authorized in the 2009 Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act under Learn and Serve America. Corporation ran one cycle of competitive grants under Learn and Serve America. And uh, you see on the slide a, um, a part of the report of the successes of Summer of Service. In post-program interviews with the initial Summer of Service cohort, which included students in a dozen low-income communities across the country, more than 70% of those students explained that if they were not participating in Summer of Service, their summers would be consumed with unstructured idle time. So innovation, next slide please. Innovations in, in civic participation continued its summer of service initiative, incorporating evaluative and teacher feedback into a new program called Summer Trek. Launched in 2014, Summer Trek has run continuously and successfully in multiple sites around the country. And you see in the slide, essentially the, the central question that students grapple with in the Summer Trek experience. Its service learning framework begins by asking students to discover critical social emotional assets. Students begin the program by identifying their own strengths. So rather than starting from a problem analysis, they start from how can I impact this situation analysis. Summer Trek engages students in practicing essential 21st century skills, communication, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, and citizenship. These are skills that are difficult to incorporate into everyday curricula during the school year. Summer Trek engages students in practicing, uh, excuse me, Teachers incorporate also required academic skills such as literacy. Students read, write, and present throughout the program. Summer Trek is authentic learning. It is real life learning, answering the question, why do I need to know this? And it introduces students to civic engagement as they explore their relationship with and responsibility to 
the communities in which they live. Next slide, please. Summer Trek has a secret sauce as well, and that is its flexibility. While the framework remains the same, the program adapts to student voice and choice, to what each group of participating students identify as meaningful service, and to what their teachers or facilitators select as academic learning goals. So what does it look like? Well, you see on the slide two uh, pieces of work that students have done in the process of identifying in the left side, identifying their issue. They're presented with several different uh, issues that they may consider, and then they decide as a group which issue they want to proceed with. And on the right side, they then develop a work plan. In other words, how are we going to address this issue? Who is going to do it? And how is the task going to get done? Lummi Nation youth in the Ferndale, Washington School District, District addressed farm to table nutrition and wellness. African American students in Richardson, Texas addressed hunger and bullying in their school. Students in Washington, DC cleaned up a watershed area feeding into the Potomac, while a boys and girls club group took on the issue of homelessness. Students in Alexandria City Public Schools developed an outdoor science lab in the courtyard at their school and developed a campaign to teach others about water pollution. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, Summer Trek is infinitely adaptable and flexible. And so of course, last summer it went virtual. And students in a DC middle school addressed racial justice, racial justice climate change and COVID-19, developing Instagram campaigns, websites, and how to stay safe and healthy during a pandemic. What you see on the slide is part of the Instagram campaign done by the students <clears throat> dealing with climate change. And this year, we are in the process of scaffolding the program to engage English language learners and special ed students in one school district while preparing to address youth and policing and gentrification in another urban school district. Summer Trek was always designed to be an on-ramp for teachers and students to get a taste of service learning and then to carry it forward into the school year. Later in this program, you're going to hear from an Alexandria district school teacher who has done just that. Service learning is neither an add-on nor a one-off strategy. It is instead a teaching and learning pedagogy. It is the way a teacher teaches and the way a student learns. Thanks, back to you, Brian. Thank you, Susan. I think it's really important to talk about service learning and the impact it has. And to that extent, I'd like to express that it's a, you know, it's, it's a year round endeavor, not just over the summer. And so I think that will transition to Michael Minx. We'll talk about the semester of service. That's right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and thank you, Susan. Uh, as a reminder uh, from what Amy Cohen introduced in the, in the history section, uh, the 2009 Serve America Act authorized uh, three new programs, uh, two of which were the Summer of Service and Semester of Service. Uh, and both are really based on the same research base uh, around the need for students to be engaged uh, over a longer period of time uh, for at least 70 hours or so. Uh, to really see the, the in-depth uh, learning and workforce skill development uh, that, that comes from the, the service learning experiences. And so these two programs were really meant to, to complement each other uh, with summer of service uh, engaging students over the summer and then <clears throat> service picking up uh, and engaging students during the, the school year. So uh, that these two programs together uh, really uh, provided that year-round uh, opportunities for, for service learning engagement uh, by students. Uh, the semester of service uh, program is based on a framework uh, developed by Youth Service America uh, in, in the mid-2000s uh, that really started with the goal of, of connecting days of service, uh, uh, starting with MLK Day in January and Global Youth Service Day uh, in April. And we always saw that, uh, that students and teachers were planning different projects for both days uh, and, and, and that that led to a little bit of extra, extra work and, and, and some extra stress. And, and so we wanted to, to really uh, capture those two days in a framework uh, that, that ran over the course of an academic semester. So, uh, so really looking at, the, at both the fall and spring semesters 
uh, where students can be engaged uh, over an extended period of time, at least 10 to 12 weeks for about 70 hours or more, uh, which if you think about a class session or two uh, uh, each week and, and then some work outside of the classroom uh, that that over the course of a semester, you, you get to that 70 hours plus that the research tells us it is, is kind of the magical tipping point for, uh, for, for when you really start seeing those, those benefits. Uh, like, uh, like all of the other programs, really engaging students in, uh, in addressing big community issues uh, uh, and, and local issues and, and examining root causes. Uh, and like summer really is, is designed to be a framework that uh, that complements and supplements the teacher's existing uh, curriculum and goals. So uh, it's, it's, it's meant to um, uh, really incorporate uh, those, those learning uh, and service goals uh, uh, to, to not uh, uh, add, a, add a new program onto teacher's work, but, but really to help them do uh, what they need to do anyway. Uh, YSA ran several semester of service programs over the last decade, uh, including one that was funded uh, by Learn and Serve America, uh, which was a STEM semester of service, uh, which focused on uh, working with STEM educators, science, technology, engineering, and math uh, classes to uh, address environmental issues. Uh, and so there were 92 teachers uh, uh, in 53 schools across uh, 19 states. Uh, we then adapted that model to, to focus on the issue of childhood hunger uh, in a program that was funded by the Sodexa Foundation. So we had uh, 35 different schools across the country do semesters of service focused on the issue of childhood hunger, and that crossed uh, a, a variety of subject areas. Uh, and then we ran uh, several, uh, several years worth of cohorts uh, in, in partnership with State Farm uh, in their education reform work. So. Uh, and, and tons of, of uh, amazing examples uh, in the STEM program. Uh, there, were, there was a, a focus on watershed restoration in Tacoma, Washington, uh, kelp forest restoration in Westminster, California, uh, water conservation in, in Washington, DC, uh, community conversations about fracking and natural resource conservation in Fort Collins, Colorado, street tree maintenance in, in New York City, uh, so, so you can see that there, there, there was a wide variety of, uh, of, of activities that took place. Um, and, and similarly with the, the hunger uh, program as well, uh, which saw uh, students uh, help pass a, a state breakfast bill in Texas, uh, helped fundraise for local food banks, uh, helped uh, high school students uh, engage the elementary and middle school students in their district uh, through uh, by recruiting them to, to work with community partners around hunger, uh, and so really had uh, a lot of impact. So, uh, so you'll see uh, across this uh, more than uh, uh, 400 teachers, uh, more than 30,000 students over, over the course of those programs, uh, and they were all evaluated uh, by, uh, by RMC Research Corporation uh, and, and consistently showed uh, improvements in academic engagement, uh, academic competence in, in the particular subject areas that, that they were teaching, especially the, in, in the STEM classes through the STEM program, uh, aspirations to go on to, to higher education uh, and to graduate, uh, workforce readiness in 21st century skill development, civic dispositions, uh, and, uh, and, and those were all uh, and those evaluations were based on both pre and post surveys of the of the teachers, of the students, and of community partners. Uh, it also included uh, comparison groups uh, for for similar classes uh, who were not participating in in these service learning activities. So so some really robust uh, evaluation, uh, and and all of these reports are linked to uh, from uh, the briefing materials page, which we'll share with you, and and. Uh, and again, consistently showed over every cohort uh, these these positive impacts. So even if even if we didn't believe the decades of research that that showed how service learning uh, was so effective, uh, we have even more evidence that uh, that this particular framework uh, is uh, is effective in in meeting these these learning goals. Uh, a couple of other uh, background uh, kind of impact information that we wanted to share uh, before, uh, as we wrap up this first panel. 
the first is a recent uh, survey uh, report uh, that was commissioned by the Allstate Foundation and, and done by uh, Civic and Heart Research uh, that, that surveyed parents and educators across the country and, and really found that, that the, the, there's a very high demand uh, for service learning. Uh, both parents and teachers, 63% uh, of parents, 70% of teachers uh, believe that service learning is, is a key approach to building the social and emotional skills uh, that, that, uh, that are so critical, uh, especially as, as we're coming out of the pandemic and trying to recover from that and, 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 and get back into in-person schooling. Uh, that the, the, even with such high demand, there, there is not nearly enough implementation of service learning across the country. Uh, so 79% of parents and 88% of teachers want their schools to offer service learning, uh, but only 23% of parents and 16% of teachers say that their schools actually do. So there's a really big gap between uh, uh, where parents and teachers want schools to be and, and where they actually are in providing these opportunities. And so we believe these, these, this new federal investment of resources is critical to closing that gap. Uh, and, then, and then finally, the, the, the gaps uh, are not only just between demand and, and the, uh, the opportunities, uh, but found that uh, it's pretty significant gaps between urban and uh, rural districts uh, and, and schools uh, that are in primarily higher income communities uh, versus lower income underserved communities. Uh, which is obviously troubling. And, uh, and so that's why the, the recommendation that this, that 50% of this, uh, of this new investment uh, be targeted at, uh, at low income uh, communities and low income schools is, is particularly important. And as we wrap up uh, uh, this, this impact panel, uh, just wanted to emphasize the, really the triple bottom line that, that service learning has. Uh, around impact on, on the students and learning outcomes, uh, impact on the community uh, through the service outcomes, and, and impact on the overall uh, civic health and democracy and civic participation and, and civic education uh, uh, in our country, uh, which, which we know recent events tell us is, is uh, incredibly important. And, uh, and, and, and service learning is really a, a, an incredibly unique approach uh, to, to meeting all three of these. Uh, you know, we know there are a lot of, of education reform strategies out there. There are a whole lot of strategies to meet community needs out there. There are a whole lot of uh, civic education and, and, and electoral reform and, and democracy uh, strengthening uh, proposals out there. Uh, but service learning is unique in that it can do all three at the same time uh, with, with, a single, with a single approach. And so uh, we believe that, that the time is now to make this new federal investment based on uh, the decades of research and, and the impact uh, that we see all of these programs have. Uh, so with that, back to Brian uh, to, to introduce our next panel. Sure, thank you, Michael. And thank you all for the presentations. Um, and I would say that service learning, we've just learned a lot about service learning and the impact that it has and the impact that investment can have. But I think that it's also important to talk about the you know, the nitty gritty of the details in terms of how it actually personally affects these people in order to get a texture of the texture of the issue. And so I'd like to invite Amy Muirs um, of the National Youth Leadership Council who will be facilitating a panel of different students and teachers and who will talk about the, their experiences with service learning. Wonderful, thanks, Brian. You're doing a great job emceeing today. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As Brian stated, I'm Amy Muirs. I'm the CEO of the National Youth Leadership Council. NYLC has been supporting the advancement and implementation of service learning for nearly 40 years um, as a way to engage young people as leaders of change for a more just, sustainable, and peaceful world. And I'm really honored to have the opportunity to introduce you to our panelists who are here to share their experiences and wisdom on the topic of service learning. So our first panelist is an elder of the service learning community. McClellan Hall is Cherokee with roots in Oklahoma. He's the founder of the National Indian Youth Leadership Project. 
So Mac is a graduate of the Native Teaching Education Program at the University of Washington. He holds a master's in education from Arizona State University. He is a former teacher and principal of two tribal schools and is currently a member of the SAMHSA Native American Center for Excellent Expert Panel on Prevention, along with their Executive Committee on Suicide Prevention and co-lead of their American Indian Alaskan Native Task Force on Suicide Prevention. Mac is also the developer of Project Venture and is the recipient of the Trailblazer Award for Service Learning and the Alec Dixon Servant Leader Award. Welcome, Mac. Joining okay. Mac. <laughs> uh, I was gonna add a couple things to my, uh, to the list of things there. I was actually at the very first National Service Learning Conference, whenever that was, I can't remember the exact year, but um, also we were the very first native organization to get a grant from the corporation back in 1990. Right. That um, and we also published the Journal of Native American Service Learning, but well, that's been on a hiatus for a while. But we might bring it back to life one of these days. <laughs> so um, my comments. I'm trying to um, condense 40 years of stuff into five minutes here. So, so uh, um, Mac, there. if you will give me just one minute, I'm going to introduce the rest of our panelists. Okay. Okay. Sure. And then. Um, um, I have the questions where you can share that, share all of that amazing history, if that's okay. Sure, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you, Mac. Um, so joining Mac, um, we have teacher Desiree K. McDuff. She is a native of Washington, D.C. but She lives in Prince George's County. Desiree is a middle school science teacher, um, and she's always been interested and fascinated in science. So I'm sure we're going to hear a little bit more about that. She's been teaching for the past 20 years, six of those um, at Alexandria City, Alexandria City Public Schools. Um, and she has been using service learning with her students um, so that they can have opportunities um, to apply with their learning in science. So welcome, Desiree. Next, we have our Oxford University freshman, Zara Ali. Zara is pursuing a degree in sociology and English lit and she hopes to use her experience growing up as bo in both a tight-knit Somali community and a predominantly white school system to address issues of education inequity and, and the opportunity gap, um, particularly as it relates to race. Um, she is a mentor of NYLC's Youth Advisory Council. She leads youth leadership and youth adult tr partnership trainings and is a member of the board of directors. And then our final panelist is Carmen Lopez Villamil. Carmen is a senior at Beacon High School in New York City. She's passionate about food justice and its role in systemic racial oppression. Um, Carmen is also a member of the board of directors of NYLC. She's a volunteer at a community molecular biology lab in Brooklyn. Um, and she is an avid member of Beacon's environmental club um, she's also a young leader in the New York City Football Club and the Captain Hover School's soccer team. Um, so welcome to all of our panelists. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, so what I'd like to do um, to get us started um, is to invite each of you to share your most memorable service learning experience with us. And we will start with our elder. Mac, would you like to um, to share your remarks with us? Um, well, I've, I've got several, I guess. I'm um, one of the one of the most memorable, I guess, would would be um, working with my friend Jane Goodall on a project at Pine Ridge, South Dakota, right now that started started and stopped several times over the last twelve <laughs> years or so. But um, we actually have a have, are really making some progress right now. One of the other highlights would be the creation of a, a search and rescue program that we developed on one of the Pueblos in, in New Mexico where high school students were trained to go out and search and rescue uh, lost hunters and sheep herders and hikers and people that uh, uh, got lost. And they were really, really successful. And it was an amazing, um, self-esteem builder for young people to be able to learn the medical and technical skills to save people's lives. It was just amazing. And they did actually save people's lives. So 
those are probably my top two. Um, and uh, let's see, I'll talk about the rest in my presentation, I guess. Wonderful. Thank you, Mac, for sharing that. Those are um, amazing service learning experiences. Carmen, let's go to you. We'll go, we'll go elder to our, um, our, I guess we'll call you our junior, our panelists. How about that? How does that sound? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can follow Jane Goodall. That's, <laughs> but yeah, I think my favorite service learning experience happened last spring, um, which I honestly didn't identify as service learning at the time. Oh, this is my cat. She's doing it. <laughs> um, and basically what happened is that the mayor of New York City eliminated our summer youth employment program. And we've already talked a little bit about how important service learning and employment is over the summer, you know, giving kids something to do, paying them for it, um, creating skills. And so decided that given the economic crisis of the pandemic, that young people should not have jobs or any sort of work-based learning experiences over the summer. So I worked with a group of Ooh, three other young people um, and coalition of other organizations to bring back the summer youth employment program in New York City. And ultimately we saved 35,000 youth jobs. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it was a really fun process. Wow. But I think for me, it was just important that we worked as a group of young people with some adult partners to create this project, plan it, um, and throughout the spring, in a way do sort of meta service learning, like do service learning to ensure that other young people could do service learning over the Wow, summer. that's amazing. I had a good time, it was fun. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. awesome. Thank you, Carmen, for sharing that. Desiree, how about you? How about okay. your service learning Perfect. experience? I can't, I can't do Jane Goodall as well. I've seen her in person, <laughs> I, I, but that's, that, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, I would have to say, and I've only been doing this for about five years now, um, this year was the best because I was stuck. I didn't quite know how I was gonna get my kids to do a science fair project in a virtual environment. It just wasn't happening. I couldn't get it together. I called Susan, she gave me something to look at. I looked at it and I said, this is wonderful. And I did it and it went in directions with my kids that I couldn't have imagined in a virtual world. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but this year, bar none, has been my favorite so far because I was really stuck. And in a, if you can do service learning in a virtual world, you can do it anywhere. So I am totally sold out that this is the way I need to teach my kids. Well, if we can have a teacher saying that this year was your favorite oh, experience, it was my best. I think <laughs> we just <laughs> mic drop walk out now, right? <laughs> really? <laughs> Zara, how about you? Uh, the most memorable experience for me was uh, in high school, we had done a caring committed conversation that focused on uh, the portrayal of history. Um, and as Amy mentioned, I went to a predominantly white school system. And so the history wasn't really representative of the cultures and history of the students of color. Um, and so having that conversation between students and faculty to sort of um, generate that, uh, to talk about that, like, um, disconnect between, um, what was being taught and what the students know to be true through the history of what their parents have told them and what their parents have lived through. Um, that was a really memorable experience for me. Absolutely. And I think that that's a great segue into my next question, which is for Desiree. How has service learning really impacted your career or your, you as a teacher? Um, okay, so I can say this and I'm looking at my cheat sheets because I don't want to forget to say anything here, but it really has been a ch game changer for me um, because it really reflects how kids learn. Um, service learning um, represents beliefs and knowledge that is not merely conveyed by, from me, the teacher, but it puts me in a position where the kids are gaining um, and with guidance, you know, um, and that reflection piece, oh, it has totally changed the way I do things in my classroom. Um, it makes critical thinking and collaboration and communication, all those skills feel so much, so more authentic when you're teaching those things to kids. Um, and the, the biggest piece for me is citizenship. It makes these kids understand that they are stewards 
and they have a say and, and it makes a difference how they look at things. So that's how it's changed my classroom. That's amazing. Yeah. So Mac, you've been doing this work for a couple of years now, yeah. <laughs> just a couple. <laughs> um, I, how, why are you, uh, why do you continue to use service learning as a strategy with your young people? Well, I'm going to go back and tell a kind of a long story here and try to condense it. Um, <laughs> um, on this, uh, I guess overall, my work has been around reintroducing the concept of service and the mm -hmm. service ethic to Native youth by helping them understand that service is a traditional value already in yep. Native culture. And there are, lang there are words for it in Native languages and there are contemporary and traditional examples of how it works and um, and some of that's gotten lost and uh, kids are not necessarily always being um, uh, brought up with that knowledge um, because of the demographics some kids are living on reservations but I think 70 some percent of native people now are living in cities and so it's been really a disruptive process um, um, anyway, um, to get my story going, um, back in the 70s, I had a really unusual dream, uh, and I didn't understand what it was, and I so I filed it away, and I, uh, in the in the early 80s, I was recruited to come back to Oklahoma and run the alternative school for Cherokee Nation, and I, um, I went back and um, uh, developed, uh, well, I, I met a, an elder who interpreted my dream for me eventually and uh, basically told me, this is what you're being asked to do. And so mm -hmm. it's turned out to be a life of service to Native youth to try to heal some of the damage that has been done by the uh, historical and generational trauma from the residential schools and boarding schools that their grandparents or, or, or uh, even previous generations were exposed to. And uh, so as a result of all that, my dream uh, turned into Project Venture, which is the most effective native youth program in the, in the country, according to the National Higher Rescue Study. And we have the highest level of um, evidence-based status that you can get in the US and it's being implemented across the US and Canada and Hawaii. And service learning is one of the three key components in that program. And it really started out with the Cherokee concept of Gadug, which means service to between clans and between families and groups of people and stuff. And I was doing this with um, Wilma Mankiller and other Cherokee people back in the early 80s before service learning really had a name or a, or a, a moment, any momentum going. Um, and so uh, the, next, the next piece of this is uh, when I was working at the school in Oklahoma, I modeled my school after uh, a Cherokee man named Redbird Smith, who was a Cherokee healer and medicine man, but also the first ever Cherokee school in Oklahoma was named after him. And so when I went back there, I was trying to emulate the model that he was um, that he was promoting in the 1800s, but using that Cherokee concept of service called Gadugi, which which uh, could very closely parallels um, service learning. So. Uh, Let's see here. In 1995, we got a five-year grant from the Kellogg Foundation to extend service learning to Native communities all across the country, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and some of the tribal colleges. And so we spent five years at that work. And, and uh, today, we're still, uh, service learning is still one of our key components in all of our programs. Uh, in Canada and Hawaii and all across the US. And uh, we actually even had an implementation of Project Venture in Hungary about 10 years ago, where they, adopt, they adapted our model to work with Roma gypsy kids in, in Hungary. And that was pretty exciting. And so it's, it's just been a, a 40 years of uh, service learning for me, even before it was even called that, we were, we were doing it. And 
uh, it, it came from a traditional model. And um, so it was a, a natural um, uh, progression for us to just keep it going. And actually during the early eighties, when I was uh, running the school for Cherokee Nation, I, I got acquainted and became good friends with Jim Kielsmeyer, who's the founder of the National Youth Leadership Council mm -hmm. and did a lot of work with them and used to come up there and uh, try to survive seven days of camp in Minnesota with the gigantic <laughs> mosquitoes. And, um, spent a lot of time up there and did a lot of work with uh, NYLC. And um, I actually ran their elders gatherings at the conference for 15 years. And then I took a break from that, but we took those elders gatherings and implemented that into our program too. So we're, we're doing that as well. Reconnecting kids with another generation of grandparents and other elders that they don't get to interact with all the time. So, and as I mentioned, I'm doing a lot of work with Jane Goodall and we're good friends and we um, we're collaborating right now on a couple of projects. So that's my story. <laughs> And it's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that, Mac, and the impact that service learning's really had um, through your programs and through your leadership. Um, Carmen, I want to I want to jump to you if that's um, if we could. Um, I would love to hear how um, you see um, service learning as a critically important path forward for for students and for for the future. No small questions for you. Yeah. <laughs> a pretty leading question, actually. Um, yeah, no, I do actually think that service learning is probably the best way to educate people. Um, and also just to live generally. Like Agreed. when I, yeah, when I joined NYLC, um, I had very little idea of what service learning looked like structurally. Like I had participated in it. I had volunteered in, in elementary school and middle school, um, but never been given sort of the tools to do it myself. So the process that like sort of changed my life was being told that like, this is how service learning works. This is what it is. And you can have agency over it. Um, so it went from like volunteering occasionally and picking up garbage at the beach to literally being a process that I use for everything. Like I can now convene a meeting and have a plan for a long-term project. Um, I hope I'm more competent in interacting with other young people and organizing sort of these impromptu projects, have a few of them going on. Um, but really service learning for me personally is an essential way to just like interact with other people and organize projects and plans. Um, and then long-term it's critical for, I think, I wanna say like integrating a society that's incredibly inequitable and incredibly segregated. So. In New York City in particular, our school system is a mess. It's, I mean, there are the usual sort of resource disparities and that type of thing, but like our schools are racially segregated. So service learning, I think, gives us an opportunity to bring new groups of kids together um, and give them the agency and power to sort of form coalitions and ideas and govern their schools in the most effective way. Like it's not just about sort of youth empowerment or sort of new ideas for how schools should function, but like just the bare minimum, I think kids should be in charge of that. And service learning is a way for kids to learn the skills to be in charge of their own lives and educations. Um, and just to, I think, make society function more equitably, but just sort of at a baseline. Wonderful. Thanks, Carmen. I think um, that leads me to a question, Zara. Um, so you um, talked briefly about this, but how did your high school service learning experience help support your transition to higher education and how you think about your future? Yeah, so because of um, the service learning experience I had in high school, um, one of the things that I was incredibly lucky to experience is um, a space where students and faculty, like even higher level faculty, um, eventually we had uh, from our care and committed conversations, a superintendent was part of them. Um, we had our principals and principals from other schools, uh, even up to like our middle school as well. And we had students involved with that. But that space where there were um, students and faculty discussing the uh, how curriculum is founded um, and really what 
has to be considered to create curriculum for students, um, whether that be uh, resources that teachers can access or funds or stuff like that, or the goals that are required by the state and federal level. Um, and having that like conversation between students and faculty really impacted how I viewed what I want to do in the future. I um, mean, going on into higher education, it allowed me to think about what, you know, professors have to think about when creating classes um, and sort of what to expect out of those classes. Um, uh, I'm studying sociology now, but a lot of the things that I'm focusing on discuss the interpersonal relationships that create um, our education system uh, and just yeah, that conversation between students and teachers um, has really supported my transition to higher education. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that. Um, so I think um, that leads, um, Desiree, um, you're hearing obviously the impacts from, from both of these um, amazing young women. Um, what benefits have you seen um, service learning bring to your students? How has that kind of manifested itself in your classroom? What I wanted to say, I kind of wanted to piggyback on Carmen and even uh, Zara. Uh, for me, unity and purpose, the sense of unity and purpose that is generated in my kids when they're working on a project that they have chosen to do. And it takes a lot of the push and pull away from me because it's something that they're vested in and they want to see come to fruition. So for me, that's been what I've seen, the benefit for my kids. I don't have to push and pull them. And they're developing, those who have some of those skills, they're being enriched. Those who don't have those skills of collaboration and communication, they're developing those skills. So it's just pretty amazing. And then the other thing um, that I do in, with my groups is they're mixed. They're mixed. It doesn't matter what you bring. We understand in this class that everybody has something that they bring to the table. It's important, it's necessary to make this thing move forward. So the kids walk away and they're interacting with each other outside of the class. And I'm like, wow, you know, they see each other in the cafeteria and they're talking about the project. So it does bring them together in a way that I don't think traditional teaching and learning happens. So I'm totally, again, I'm sold on this method. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I wanna thank, um, all of you for joining us today, for sharing your insights, your wisdom, and how service learning is really um, a positive, um, has students be able to engage in a positive contribution, um, enhances their leadership and their learning. Um, your uh, answers were absolutely amazing. So again, thank you each for being here. So Brian, I'm gonna turn it back to you um, or to Susan, um, one of you for our wrap up, but thank you panelists. Sounds good. Yeah, I was just gonna pass it to Susan. Um, once again, I wanted to thank everyone for the wonderful opportunity. And it was really interesting to get to know you guys and hear your story. So thank you panelists as well. So Susan. Well, that was uh, an amazing hour. I appreciate that. Um, I want to thank the uh, presenters, especially for um, for participating in in today's briefing. Um, just to reiterate, um, Mike has just put up the uh, web page uh, that we developed for uh, this briefing, and I hope that you will all check it out. Just to reiterate, uh, the coalition is pushing for the funding of those at 250 million a year for uh, the service learning fund based on the recommendation from the National Commission. In effect, this would basically restore funding to Learn and Serve America, which was eliminated in, in uh, 2011. So we hope that you will join us if you're interested in being part of our advocacy efforts to do that. Please contact uh, us at the coalition um, and we would uh, certainly welcome your, uh, your help with reaching out to um, members of Congress to see, the, see if we can get this into the, um, this year's uh, appropriation to the corporation. I think unless anybody else on the steering committee has anything else that they wanna add, I think that we are just ending uh, exactly on time. There was one question that came in to, um, about the funding for nonprofits to partner with schools, uh, which I responded to. And then there was a second question, particularly to 
uh, Carmen and Zara about um, how their experience in high school with service learning affected their, um, their plans for post-secondary um, education, which they, they will be able to respond to on the website as well, just not to go um, over time. The website address is once again posted in the chat, and we hope that you will all check that out and then join us in our efforts to um, try and get this funding to the corporation this year so that all of us can enjoy the benefits of service learning. I think that we're so, um, so well documented by our panel today. So unless there's anything else, thank you everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the steering committee. And thank you to all of you who uh, participated in the briefing today. Take care.